Welcome to Map Crow, the RPG art show. My name is Kyle, and today we're summoning a one shot. So I have this problem, and I don't think I'm the only one. The TTRPG community is full of incredible creators that are making the most beautiful books I have ever seen. And I buy a lot of them. And the problem is that I don't actually find myself using them as often as I'd like. Well, that stops today because we've created Agnostic, the TTRPG prep method. My writing partner, Kenny Webb, and I have created this book that gives you a method of arranging all of your favorite books and zines and images into a summoning circle made of separate stacks and turning each of those stacks into a random table that you can use to create a random one-shot adventure that indulges in your desires to use all of these books that you've been collecting. The Agnostic Zine comes with a couple of example blank worksheets for your prep and a ton of random tables and images to get your creative juices flowing. I'm going to explain essentially how everything works in this book, but if you like what you see, check the link in the description below for physical and digital copies. The agnostic prep method is not really for first time DMs. It's designed for people who have been running games for a couple of years and are neck deep in amazing books they need an excuse to use. This also really isn't designed to support a long running campaign. This is designed to plan out a, a single adventure or maybe even just a single evening of crazy fun. Now, this is partly because we want to acknowledge that if you could find a group that would actually be interested in running a longer game using one of these books, it would have happened already. Many players and many DMs want some kind of confidence, some kind of assurance that uh, a long-term game is going to pay off. It's going to be worth all of the effort that goes into, you know, scheduling, attending and playing and planning and putting all this creative energy into. And that's why it's harder to run some of these more obscure books. But we're willing to bet that you can talk almost any gaming group into running a single game Game that is specifically designed to be kind of off the hinges. All you need is some kind of flimsy excuse, like your birthday's coming up or Halloween's just around the corner. Get people excited about it. Tell people that this is going to be a little nuts and I'm willing to bet that if you're excited, they can be excited at least for a single night. The first step of this prep method is to arrange a stack of six books. You can use zines, magic cards, art books, poetry, whatever you want. As long as you can discern words or images from it, it'll work. These six stacks are tasks, what your party will have to attempt to do, trials, the obstacles or monsters or traps in their way, terrain, kind of the location and general area that the adventure is going to take place in, travelers, which would be like NPCs or, you know, hostile people walking around, treasures, the kinds of weird fantasy bric-a-brac you can acquire in the adventure, and trivia, which is just a bunch of random connections that you can draw between different things in the stack. Let's start out with our task. I rolled a 27, so I'm going to pick a page in the stack that is 27% of the way through the stack. I like to just pick the first word that pops out at me, but we also have procedures for picking where on the page to look for your word. I see the word spellcasting, and right away I'm thinking that there's some kind of ritual going on that we need to stop in our adventure. I'm going to roll again to find a subject for this task. I get a 32, so I'm going to pick something that is that far up the stack. And I see the word house from this beautiful poem by Yoko Ono. So I have spellcasting and house, and now I have to think of some threat, some stakes for the story, some reason to go into this house and stop the spellcasting. The first thing that pops into my head is that there's a witch in this house and the witch is going to open a pit to 
the hell or something. You know, it doesn't have to be a great idea. It just needs to be a plausible connection that puts these two ideas together. And I like to just use the first idea that pops into my head in these cases. The next thing I need to do is find a trial. So I'm going to pull something from 87% of the way through the stack in my trials and I get griffins. There you go. All right, we know that there's a big griffin fight somewhere in this adventure. The method then asks me to come up with a reason why this griffin is dangerous and also come up with some evidence that the griffin is in the area. What does it leave in its wake? Again, going with my first idea, I'm going to say that the griffin is some kind of guardian or familiar that is in service to the witch and that it leaves these kind of giant owl pellets of undigested bone and hair and clothes left over from the last group of people that tried to stop the ritual. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking that this sounds like a fairly vanilla adventure, a, a go stop a witch and fight a griffin. But trust me, the method will not allow this to stay too safe for too long, especially with some of the books I put in these decks. I'm going to roll for Travelers next, but you can roll for whatever you want. It's just probably more helpful to roll for trivia last. What we are looking for is some kind of hint as to what this NPC is obsessed with. What are they driven to near mania to accomplish? And this weirdo in this Bruegel painting looks like he's really, really excited to get arrested. So our first NPC is obsessed with getting arrested. The next step is to come up with a name for them and come up with how they are dressed. So I'm thinking I'm just gonna pull a name out of the back of the book here. We'll call him Barley. And I've decided that Barley dresses up like a goblin and hangs out at the edge of town and spooks wayward travelers and tries to get them to send the town guard after him. Now, while one monster fight might be just enough to get us through an evening of fantasy fun, I do think that having a couple of different people you could run into would be more helpful, so I'm going to roll up a second NPC. There's no set limitation to how many times you can roll in each stack. You just do this until you get something that you like or feel like something's starting to come together, and then you can just take it away from there. I really like this owl who is absolutely creeping on whatever is happening in this scene. So I'm just gonna say that this owl is a spy. Uh, it's, it's another one of these servants that's circling around the area working for this witch. Looking on my random name table, we're naming him Furrow. Now let's find out the terrain of this adventure. Where is the location that this adventure is going to happen? I roll up a random page from Cadillacs and Dinosaurs and it looks like this adventure happens in a volcanic wasteland. We're then supposed to come up with a description of why this area is beautiful or wonderful in some way. So I'm imagining these like geyserous mists getting tossed into the evening sun and painting rainbows in the air. And along with what makes the terrain wonderful and beautiful, we also come up with how it is perceived by the other senses. And I'm thinking with all the geysers, there's probably a lot of sulfur and rotten egg smell in the air too. We try not to have you roll too many times for each item, but if you're feeling really stuck, you can always check out the other tables that we have in the book or just keep rolling until you get something that really clicks. Next, we're gonna come up with a couple of magical treasures. I pull the word scuttling and I see this beautiful illustration at the bottom of the page of the Book of Gob, and I'm thinking that there's some kind of like scuttling intelligent steamer trunk, kind of like that thing from Color of Magic the intelligent luggage that follows people around like a puppy. And if it's like bigger on the inside, I'm imagining all the weird shenanigans that the party could get into by like climbing inside and smuggling themselves through an, a, a window or something. I don't know, there's all kinds of nonsense that this could get into and I am here for it. The next little treasure that I roll up is from a page of Jack Kirby's Fourth World Omnibus. 
and I really like the looks of this exploding can. So I'm imagining, yeah, like these little homemade alchemical bombs are gonna be somewhere in the workshop or hidden in a stash around the house. I really don't even need to decide where any of these items are going to go in the adventure, not right now. I just need a list of them so if the players are investigating somewhere and it seems like there should be something interesting they find, I have a list of treasures to pull from. Let's do one more treasure. And I roll up my copy of Headlopper, and not only is our titular character doing his titular thing, but uh, it gives me an idea because there's this beheaded witch in this story, and how cool would it be to have a headsman axe that is cursed to allow people to like live with their head being severed from their body? Last thing I need to do is come up with trivia that connects things from each category of our prep. So I roll up this prompt from Thousand Year Vampire about transcending to a higher plane, and that needs to connect one of my travelers to the terrain. So I'm thinking that Furrow, our owl spy, uh, is uh, kind of cursed to patrol the area until he delivers one of the true names of these interlopers, these adventurers that are trying to interrupt the ritual. And if he does deliver one of the true names of the adventurers to the witch, he will be turned back into a human. Next, I need to connect my trial to one of my treasures. And I get this gorgeous cartooning about these, you know, cooking implements and severed body parts. And I get the idea that maybe the witch has used the cursed headsman axe to sever the head of this griffin and has has the head in a cage somewhere in the house, and that's how it's compelling the griffin's body to be its servant. This witch sounds like a real piece of work, and it's all emerged from these chance operations. It's not something that I would have thought of if I had just was staring at a blank sheet of paper. And also notice that the vanilla monster of a griffin is made more interesting by connecting it with trivia to other pieces of the adventure. Let's get one more piece of trivia that connects our task with our terrain. I roll up a page from Morkborg and I see the accursed den. It's calling to me and I then am flooded with this vision of this house that is sunken into this sulfurous gurgling crater in the middle of these wastelands. And maybe the whole reason that these wastelands are sulfurous in the first place is because of this ritual that is calling up a pit from hell. I mean, there's still plenty of more prep work to do. I need to come up with some kind of excuse to kind of compel our players into taking this quest. Maybe they get conscripted by the local witchfinder captain who returns wounded from a failed attempt to stop this ritual in the first place. I mean, there's, there's still lots to do, but I don't have to put all of my creative energy into coming up with brand new ideas. I can now spend that on connecting the idea that I've generated through this process. I grab a couple stat blocks from my system of choice, I grab a couple of maps from like Dyson logos or somewhere, and I am ready to go. And I finally got to use all these beautiful books and zines that I've been accumulating over the years. Hey, speaking of accumulating cool books and zines, Old Roads is back in print. That's right, the zine that launched this YouTube channel is back in print for the first time since its Kickstarter fulfillment two years ago. Old Road's second edition is split into two different zines, one with just the maps and the other with all of the rumor tables and adventure hooks and NPCs. And these new zines are going to be in a bundle with not just agnostic, but three 18 by 24 black and white fold out maps by yours truly. We have a giant isometric dungeon, the bizarre city of Canticle, and the heretofore uncharted waters of the Wine Dark Sea, all in print for the first time ever. Check the description in the link below to pre-order your bundle today, and maybe next time I'll see you on the old roads. And welcome to the After Crow. I just wanted to take this moment to shout out all of the books that I had in my stack, even if I wasn't uh, using them directly. But the first on the list is Grapefruit by Yoko Ono. It has one of my absolute favorite pieces of art in it. 
Um, so definitely give that one a check in the links in the description below. There's also Liminal by uh, Alexi Vela and Neo Rot. And uh, full disclosure, I am uh, featured. Uh, I get to write a little prompt in this book, but it's a wonderful solo horror RPG. Definitely check it out if you like the back rooms and that kind of thing. Next is Cyborg from Christian Sellen and Johan Noor, and I apologize for mispronouncing everybody's names. Um, this came out somewhat recently, and I just adore this book and all of its random tables. And of course, Morkborg needs no introduction, and that is by Johan Noor again, but also with a writing partner, Pella Nilsson such an inspiration for me in terms of art and layout. Next up is uh, the book of Gob from uh, Paulo Greco and the Lost Pages. Um, it's an anthology, lots of different designers, lots of different artists, and uh, not particularly well documented on their uh, store page, but nonetheless, um, lots of amazing work in that spell book. Thousand Year Vampire uh, is a, a solo RPG about being a vampire living an exceptionally long life by Tim Hutchings. Uh, came out in 2020, just in time for the big uh, uh, solo RPG boom with uh, everybody social distancing. Um, it's a really gorgeous book to just own and uh, full of lots of wonderful prompts. Forbidden Psalm by Kevin Rahman uh, is a kind of a, a miniatures agnostic solo war game designed to kind of operate in the um, Morkborg universe, and uh, it has some really, really good monster design and uh, some some wonderful little like combat missions. There's always a ticking clock in these combat missions that really make the um, the solo experience sing and gives it this urgency and tooth to it. It has some of my favorite monster designs in it. Next up is Into the Weird and Wild by Charles Ferguson Avery. And uh, this is another wonderful game that's right up my alley in terms of art styling. It's a bit more grotesque than I uh, tend to draw, uh, but man, I just cannot get enough of these kind of art forward uh, books. And uh, I own one of these t-shirts and I wear it all the time and get compliments on it. Um, Rocketo is a now out of print book by Frank Espinosa. It takes place in an oceanic post-apocalypse. It's got mutants and robots and, you know, shark assassins. Um, absolutely uh, uh, sets my brain on fire every time I flip through it. Uh, it kind of makes me feel lazy. Um, also, there is, of course, the Hellboy series, uh, which uh, Mike Mignola is uh, drawing from a, a really heavy, like, burn and bury inking style with these hard geometric shadows and um, really abstract textures. Continuing the theme of books I heard about just by watching Questing Beast, there is Fire on the Velvet Horizon by Patrick Stewart and Scrap Princess, who is one of my favorite living artists, uh, uh, without understatement. Um, and then there is Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, originally published as Xenozoic Tales by Mark Schultz. It's a wonderful two-fisted pulp magazine about a post-apocalypse in which dinosaurs roam the earth. Um, really great stuff. Next up, we have a couple of gorgeous zines by Luke Gearing, uh, who did a, a couple of books in this Broken System series. Um, this is the second one called Monsters Ampersand, and it feels like it's made out of like cut up poetry or something. Um, gorgeous stuff. And then we have this, which is uh, uh, the first issue, which is only available as a print file. And you, you have to just print it out and staple it together. Uh, it really kind of, it's a big Ask, but I, I adore it for it. Next up, there is Adventure Game in Need of Translation by Skullboy, uh, which uses uh, asemic writing and iconography to make this really kind of mystical experience as you look through and just wonder what kind of game you could play with the instructions you can't translate. Then there's Gardens of Yin by Emmy Allen. Uh, it's it's a it's a kind of a procedurally generated elven garden with all kinds of 
of uh, uh, interesting uh, monsters and encounters filled throughout. It's an OSR classic. Jack Kirby's Fourth World Omnibus. Uh, you can really see Kirby's influence on some of the other artists we've already seen today, like Mignola and Espinosa. It may as well just be a hard and fast rule for Agnostic that you must include a Jack Kirby comic. And of course, there is Headlopper by Andrew McLean. And uh, this thing, if you like Conan, but you feel like it could just use more graphic violence and more uh, fantasy weirdness, uh, I highly recommend this book as well. Um, but thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.